special treat for you. We are going to be talking about Shady Ladies of the Gas Lamp and give you a different view, a, a historical perspective of what the stingery was like and, and give you an idea about what life was really like for a lot of the working women who were in the gas lamp. We have two wonderful speakers, Jim and McVeigh, and um, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's really been a long, long <laughs> Who do our shady, our uh, uh, Hop Heads and Shady Ladies tour. They go into, they do a tour around the gas lamp and they go into the, some of the old bars, they go into the Tivoli, they go into the Tipsy Crow, and then they come here to the Horton Grand and they talk about what the history was like in the, in the active period. Um, in early gas lamp history. So tonight that they're going to give us a historical perspective of that era. So I'd like to invite Jim Heinzel to come on up. Well, thank you very much. Good evening and um, welcome to the wonderful Horton Grant. Can everybody hear me? Do a sound check. We're good. We're good. Okay. Well, you know, I'm not sure how we became experts in the red light district. <laughs> Definitely not from personal experience. Darn right. <laughs> I, I did offer to do some first-hand, shall we say, hands-on research, and I was immediately shot down. But it's an important part of San Diego's history, and one that has been often ignored. Jerry McMullen, who was the director of the Sarah Museum in the 1950s, wrote that shortly after his appointment, he came across a piece of information about the stingery. He looked under S for the stingery file. No stingery. He looked under P for prostitution. Nope. Um, he tried houses of ill repute and ill repute houses of. Still no luck. He says he eventually called his predecessor and asked, where's the stingery file? And the response was, there is no stingery file. We do not approve of the stingery. So research has been a little bit of a challenge. As one historian, is this too loud? I, I sound like okay. As one historian noted, um, the stingery was not the sort of place you wrote home about. Nobody sent postcards from the stingery that said, "Having a wonderful time. Wish you were here." <laughs> Reporters from the San Diego Union, San Diego Union, and San Diego Sun did spend a lot of time in the area, purely for professional reasons. I'm sure. Even so, what we know about the stingery is a lot more story than history. We do have proof, this is the city police blotter from 1896, we do have proof that ladies were arrested on occasion. Although the official records are a little vague on names, you'll notice Louise French from France. And Marie Indian Squaw and her sister um, Rosa Indian Squaw. So, but this is a significant. <laughs> this is a significant portion. We do this on the tours too. <laughs> this is a significant part of San Diego's past. And one of our goals in leading the Shady Ladies and Pop Heads tours has been to try to give a voice to some of the anonymous gals of the gas lamp. The Tivoli likes to style itself as the oldest saloon in the gas lamp. Wells Fargo claims to be the oldest business in all of San Diego. But prostitution is assuredly the oldest profession. We can only speculate on why it thrived here. Well, well, straight-laced Midwest uh, was settled by farmers who needed wives and children to help them with their crops. San Diego attracted 
brash young men in search of a quick fortune and maybe a little bit of adventure to boot. It's no coincidence that the San, Diego, the San Diego Stingery, with its rowdy saloons, dance halls, houses of ill repute, got its start during the real estate boom of the 1880s. San Diego's new railroad brought more customers. And at least one historian traces the term red light district to Dodge City, Kansas, where railroad workers like to visit the ladies of negotiable value. And when they went into a brothel, <clears throat> the trainmen would leave their red lights on the doorstep outside so they could be, so people would know where they were so they could be summoned in case of an emergency. The madam soon realized that red lights were an effective advertising tool and the custom spread. San Diego, in San Diego, the red light district was centered in the stingery, loosely defined as the area south of Market down to the harbor and from 1st uh, to 5th. It's located between the wharf and the business district and it catered to local businessmen as well as the sailors getting off the ship. In 1890, Joseph Coyne, the chief of police at the time, announced that he intended to keep women of the lewd order at the lower end of 2nd, 3rd, and 4th streets. The city attempted to pass an ordinance to keep the prostitutes south of H, or Market Street. Well, they finally had to settle on banning the sale of alcohol to patrons in rooms in the adjoining, any room adjoining a saloon. Even without the official sanctions, Market Street served as the deadline. No decent women would be caught south of Market, and no decent man would venture south of Market unless he was in search of trouble or excitement. That doesn't mean that there wasn't a lot of travel south under cover of darkness, or that everything north of Market was all that terribly respectable. The ladies of the Stingery could be arrested if they traveled north of the deadline. This gave rise to a whole industry of bicycle messengers who rode down to the bordellos to deliver clothing and meals to the, uh, from the stores and restaurants on the other side of town. They especially favored the Minneapolis Cafe at 5th and F. One particularly thirsty lady, known as Dutch Annie, had a standing order for a bottle of gin to be delivered to her place of business every morning. The most notorious part of the stingery was south of Island, in San Diego's Chinatown, which was most notable for its saloons, gambling halls, opium dens, body houses, and dance halls. A reporter from the San Diego Union dutifully ventured into one of the dance halls in the 1880s and reported seeing about 400 callow youths and balding rakes. Happily swilling beer, listening to alleged music from an alleged orchestra <laughs> while feasting their eyes at the balcony above where gaudy women, scantily clad, displayed themselves at the railing and waved their handkerchiefs at the patrons below. Quite a sight. Chinatown was also the home of the more affordable working girls uh, who worked out of what were known as cribs. These were shacks about the size of an outhouse facing out into the courtyard. One compound between I and J had at least 50 rooms where the girls paid $14 a week in rent plus a percentage of their income to the protector of the compound. Over the door of each crib was the name of the occupant, such as Rosie or Dolly or Sadie or Tamale Kenya, <laughs> along with a horseshoe for good luck. <coughs> Historian Elizabeth McPhail writes that each crib was furnished with a chair, a wash bowl, and a pitcher. A few had, few had even a bed or a mattress. Several had an illuminated copy of the Lord's Prayer hanging from the wall, Others had a cherub or the Virgin Mary. In some parts of the Wild West, 
the Chinese ladies were known as sing-song girls for their distinctive sales pitch. Two bits looky, four bits feely, six bits dewy. <laughs> 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 okay, the brick buildings of Fifth housed the all-purpose girls. These were girls who worked in the shops and offices during the week and moonlighted on the weekends on Saturday night. Some shared a room. One walked the streets to drum up business, while the other entertained a guest inside. For a woman without a husband or a father, prostitution was one of the few ways she could support herself and her children. A town could employ only so many teachers, shop girls, and seamstresses. And the concept of a living wage, especially for women, was unheard of. I am 28 years old and would gladly leave the sporting life if there were in a way, another way that I could support myself and my family. I have a crippled mother and a young sister to support. The socialists blamed it all on capitalism. They claimed that under socialism, young women would no longer have to sell themselves to earn a decent living, and young men would earn enough to support a wife and uphold the sanctity of the home. This was the most honest deal of all. Cash money for services rendered, plain and simple. One historian estimates the height of the land buying frenzy a young man in San Diego could find entertainment in one of 71 different bar rooms or in the company of one of 350 ladies of the evening employed at least 100 bordellos. Well, with that kind of competition, you needed a gimmick to stay in business. And the gals of the gas lamp were as good at marketing their, their wares as Horton was marketing his corner lots. Down at the turf club at the northeast corner of 4th and J, maybe Goldstein hired the Lutheran church organist to play hymns to lure the customers inside. <laughs> if the customers got too rowdy, her housekeeper, a Negro woman known only as Mrs. Williams, was there to keep order. At the Golden Poppy Hotel, Located above what was once the Bank of Commerce, a fortune teller who called herself Madame Cora enticed customers by traipsing through the streets with one of her charming daughters. If they stopped in a store to inspect the merchandise, the elderly and dignified Madame Cora would carry on a sedate chat with the proprietor while her charming young companion flirted with every man in sight and arranged for future meetings. With her spectacles and silver hair, Madame Cora <coughs> appeared totally trustworthy. A reporter for the San Diego Union once stopped by for a reading. I predict a long life, future greatness, money, ambition gratified, and pleasure. Yes, much pleasure. <laughs> the reporter looked. Uh, the reporter looked up to, to see Madame Cora puffing on a cigar, while a scantily clad female stood in the doorway. He claims to have escaped the, out the door with his virtue and wallet intact, but Madame Cora had an even more colorful means of marketing her wares. One source says that she would dress up her ladies in different colored uh, dresses, like, said in the newspaper, like so many multicolored Easter eggs. And each of the girls would have a handful of marbles that would match the color of her dress. So if she saw a gentleman that might, have, might look like a prospective customer, she would give the gentleman a marble. And maybe that gentleman, maybe not this one, but maybe some gentleman that evening would go to the uh, Golden Poppy and hand his marble to Madame Cora, and Madame Cora would then know exactly 
who he was looking for. And she would direct him upstairs to the door, the red painted door, and he would open the red painted door, and there in the red wallpapered room would be the lady of his dreams in her red dress. <laughs> and we've, she has her marble all ready to go. And then there was Ida Bale. Striking redhead, Ida also arrived with the boom. And like any ambitious woman, Ida concluded that the real money was in management. By February of 1888, the San Diego Union reported that in the midst of the low hovels at Third and I, there looms the notorious Sherman House, which assumes the proportions and pretensions of a Maison de Joux. Here are 13 girls presided over by Ida Bailey, red-headed Ida, who is always such a conspicuous figure in the front rows of the opera house. Well, when the bubble burst, the population fell from 40,000 back down to about 16,000. Ida's fortunes sagged as well. The city directory in 1889 lists Mrs. W.E. Castle as an inmate of Ida Bailey at 253 Sixth Avenue. The next year, Ida appears in the directory at 251 Fifth Avenue. No stated occupation, but her name was in boldface type, whatever that might be. But by 1903, Ida had realized her dream. A fancy parlor house with a few select girls catering to the town's elite specifically well-groomed gentlemen with fat wallets. Her canary cottage was a pale yellow one-and-a-half-story house located off an unassuming alleyway at 4th Avenue. She was, it was surrounded by a white picket fence. The neighborhood children liked to play in the front yard, and Ida liked young children and often gave them candy, although it was said she often shoot away the little girls. <laughs> Inside Canary Cottage, Ida and her ladies offered the best of everything. We're a little more high class than some of those girls. Miss Ida makes sure of that. No smoking and none of that flashy makeup. And we dress up like we're going to the opera. And when a gentleman caller comes by, we like to sit in the parlor first, heck, get acquainted, maybe talk about the weather. Except if it's the police chief, of course. We know he's a busy man, so we get right down to business. <laughs> Ida periodically promoted her business by renting a horse and barouche from the Diamond Carriage Company and driving three or four of her best ladies up around Bankers Hill. The newspaper noted that the men in the neighborhood reacted to this spectacle in one of two ways. Some, he said, thought it was funnier than hell. Others, however, fearing a friendly blue from one of the ladies who he might have known in love with, let us say, the biblical sense, suddenly found chores to be done in the backyard. It might be said that Madam Ida was the founder of outdoor advertising in San Diego. It's sort of like parking your truck over the 805 with a big sign that says, Jesus saves, yes. but with a slightly different message. <laughs> Around that time, Ida opened up her dream house. Uh, about the time Ida opened up her dream house at Canary Cottage, a group of respectable women uh, met to discuss the local houses of impurity and the unfortunate women caught in the toils. They formed an organization called the Purity League, which one reporter defined as short-haired women and long-haired men that began their crusade against the evils of the stingery. Ida Bailey was high on the Purity League's hit list, but she didn't have anything to worry about because she had friends in high places that will let, would let her know of any upcoming raid, except 
for one fateful evening when police in their derby hats and droopy mustaches rushed up the lane and pounded on the door. Open up in the name of the law, they said. Well, two gentlemen in the upstairs boudoir quickly grabbed their wits and their trousers and went out to the window, down the rubber tree, across the yard and over the fence. They say the police chief was the first one over the fence, but the mayor wasn't far behind. <laughs> But Ida, was, Ida saw the handwriting on the wall, and by 1907, she had turned over Canary Cottage to a woman named Julia Barton, who eventually showed up in the police reports for vagrancy. In, uh, in January of 1904, the Purity League organized a meeting where area pastors who railed against the, the cribs as violations of God, humanity, and the city ordinances. The following Sunday, after a rousing sermon, the Purity League and their followers headed outside to a, a gospel wagon, fully loaded with the church choir and an organ. Nearly a thousand people followed the wagon down 4th Avenue, singing Onward Christian Soldiers and wagging their fingers at the dens of iniquity along the way. The next morning, the Purity League went to the city council and demanded that they close down the stingery and wipe out the evil of the red light district. But the city council, well, for various reasons, they said, well, no, our agenda is full. Sorry about that. If those pious women spend a little more time at home instead of gadding about to meetings and rallies, their husbands might not have to wander down the wrong path and come down here to visit me. <laughs> but eventually, virtue reared its ugly head. With the coming of the Panama Canal and the Panama California Exposition, the powers uh, that be agreed it was time to clean up the city. In 1910, they gave the job to one Walter Bellin, a plumbing inspector with the health department, and paid him $90 a month. This is an interesting little map here, done by Bella in about 1910. It's sort of turned over. This is north. This is uh, Market Street. Here's where, here's where we are. Here's the, uh, the uh, museum. And if you'll note, it says Canary Cottage was here. It's actually over here. But it's really interesting to note that we're sitting right where the worst of the cribs and um, brothels were. So um, I don't know, maybe Sandy can commune with the, the ghosts uh, along the way here. But uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, we have what Bellin uh, had and thought what was there. Bellin bravely strode through what was known as Wild Cat Alley, the narrow passageway contain connecting the shanties and cribs of the stingery. His focus was on the state of the buildings himself rather than what went on inside. He was offended that the local newspapers never printed the names of the upstanding citizens who owned and profited from the buildings that housed the opium dens, gambling halls, and brothels. Bellin dodged death threats and at least one bullet before tearing down or burning down about 120 of the most offensive shacks. In one notable instance, Bellin and his crew set fire to Cozy Cottage, a house of ill repute built on the pilings over the bay. Sailors on board two naval ships out in the harbor thought the city was on fire and headed to shore to form a bucket brigade. Well, Bellin assured them that everything was under control and they returned to their ships. Well, after six years of such activity, Bellin proclaimed, the waterfront has been cleaned up, the stingery has been wiped out, Chinatown has almost disappeared, and minimum health standards have been met. The red light district is no more. Well, the city, however, 
was not even remotely free of vice. But as Bellin himself noted in the stingery, it's not what you do, it's what you get caught at that counts. <laughs> Keno Wilson, who had been appointed the police chief in 1909, argued against closing down the stingery. He claimed that he could keep a better eye on things, uh, the illicit activities in this restricted district. Um, he can keep an eye on things, he could keep a lid on it. In fact, the city's earlier efforts to, to close some of the seedier stingery bars had resulted in more saloons in the area around where Horton Plaza is now. And the ladies moved uptown too. You can see here in 1900, most of, we kept track of who was who and where, where they lived. Um, they were down here mostly south of the deadline. By 1910, we're moving, it's the, the number of prostitutes and brothels moving uptown. So um, it started to spread going north. Kino was reluctant to take away the women's livelihoods without giving them an option for other employment or, or transportation out of town. In response, the Vice Suppression, the Vice Suppression Committee offered the Door of Hope, which had opened in 1898 to assist fallen women. It had recently moved from 1243 Front Street to larger quarters in City Heights. And he proposed, and they proposed taking in any of the dislocated ladies. The San Diego Union was instantly flooded with letters of protest. Property owners in City Heights held meetings to express their indignation. And nimbyism was not a new thing. Uh, when the Board of Supervisors pledged $125 a month for upkeep, members of one church sent letters in protest opposing the door of hope in their district. Others noted that the women wouldn't need to ref wouldn't want to reform anyway, and the money would be best spent filling the potholes in the roads. The prospective residents weren't impressed either. Door of hope. The name alone would keep me away. I say every woman in this district is exactly where she wants to be. We don't need anyone to reform us. By 1912, the Purity League had had enough. In October, several ministers and prominent women, including R.C. Allen and Dr. Charlotte Baker of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, gathered over 200 names on a petition to close the hellhole of the stingery once and for all. Their vice, vice suppression committee finally persuaded the city council to act, and partly because recent city election had put their candidates into office. A raid was planned for Sunday morning, November 10th. And although the raid was supposed to be a secret, just before, just before dawn, a dozen madams and their lovers packed their bags and made their way through the thick fog to the San Diego Depot to catch the first train out of town. The bicycle messengers rode through the district, ringing their handlebar bells and pounding on doors. The cops are coming, they said. Well, few of the women heeded their warnings. Most stayed where they were. Local legend has it that the first raid started at the, the Yuma building uh, on Fifth Avenue. But one report, uh, one newspaper account says that the, the police first stopped at the Oasis at 416 Fourth Avenue, where four women rubbing the sleep from their eyes and six men were taken to the police station. The women were charged with vagrancy. The men, who proved they were upstanding citizens, were let go. Within a couple hours, the police paddy wagon noticed Black Maria was full of women. The police marched, down, uh, marched several dozen others down the street to the police station and fed them ham sandwiches and coffee. By early afternoon, the police had rounded up 138 women, along with Rags, a heavily perfumed terrier that trails behind its owner, a prostitute named Goldie. The ladies filled the police station's big room, smoking enough cigarettes to create a fog bank. Officials informed the women they had two choices. 
they could get out of town or take a legitimate job with the city. Well, only two of the 138 accepted the offer of a job. One later changed her mind the next morning, and the, the remaining one was found to be insane. <laughs> Which I can tell you from personal experience is a job prerequisite for working for the San, city of San Diego. <laughs> Officials warned of, uh, okay. Um, most women were doubtful that their career change would be successful. I would like to be good, but the world won't let me. It must keep me as I am. Or that the locals would accept them as respectable women. I saw one of your committee this morning, and the way she looked at me put me in mind of what would happen if me and my friends were to reform on your terms. She walked past us holding her skirts away as if she were afraid she would be contaminated by breathing the very same air with us. Well, on Monday morning, 136 prostitutes crowded the municipal court. Judge, Judge Peter Burr sentenced them five at a time for a vagrancy and promised that he would suspend the $100 fine if they left town by 3 p.m. Sixteen women bought steerage on a steamship governor for San Francisco. The rest promptly headed for the train station. The next day, the San Diego Sun closed the lid on the district. They said, thus the stingery, called a necessary evil by some, a cancer and an eyesore by others, the stingery, which has survived many crusades and administrations, making it famous from ocean to ocean, has ceased to be. Well, for a while the saloon suffered, the bicycle messengers went out of business, and the sailors voted to spend their shore leave in San Francisco, where presumably the Purity League had yet to rear its ugly head. Most of the ladies, however, had bought round-trip tickets. Some were afraid to come back knowing that Wilson would recognize them and throw them in jail. Instead, they sold or gave away the return tickets to their sisters in Los Angeles, who had been evicted in a similar cleanup a couple months earlier. Those ladies rode the train south and became hostesses in Mission Hills and on the dirt road leading to El Cajon, where neighbors noticed they seemed to have an unusual number of male visitors. Within a few months, prostitution had spread all over the city and what was in, in what was known as the scattering. So many men propositioned women who were not prostitutes that there was talk of an ordinance to allow the ladies to carry revolvers. In the years and the year after the raid, the police arrested 92 women for prostitution. In 1914, that number more than doubled. Chief Wilson complained that when the Panama California Exposition opened in 1915, the city was overrun by immoral women. By 1918, when World War I made San Francisco a true Navy town, there were more than 400 arrests. Even Walter Bellin, who took credit for cleaning up the stingery, admitted that the trade had spread all over town. So, what became of the gas lamp's infamous shady... Our last slides, you see. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, black, infamous shady ladies. Madame Cora and Mamie Goldstein have disappeared into the myths of history. Jerry McMullen recalls spotting Ida Bailey on the streets in 1922. An old woman. She was 55. <laughs> somewhat worse for wear. But he says, you could tell that she had been a humdinger in her day. When the fire department distributed the food baskets to the poor at Christmas, they always made sure that Ida got the one with the largest turkey. Well, today the stingery is long gone. The Tivoli still stands, although its roof has sagged a bit from age. 
Wells Fargo has, its, has seen its own scandals of its own, and the Horton brand here has replaced the restaurant in tribute to Ida Bailey for one with the less titillating name of salt and whiskey. And as for the oldest profession, well, I'll leave that research to you. Thank <laughs> you.